Anyway, this is the usual disclaimer to sort of say that I've declared all my interests, etc. I said the most relevant one, actually, funnily enough, here is Flexi because um, it's an intelligence rules processing engine and it's being used to process the access under HIPAA to the medical databases in America because that's very bound around with rules as to who's accessing it from where, when, etc. And it's interesting to see that the, because the rules keep changing, you've got to have a flexible approach to these things, which is maybe relevant for the, for the future um, and part of the discussions. And let's see if I get the right click. Good God, yes. Um, now the question, is there a role for government? Well, the answer is obviously yes. There is a role for government. But the question is what? Uh, how much should they interfere or not interfere? How much are they dangerous when they interfere, etc.? Because I'm afraid that I'm rather like most people. Um, I'm a bit selfish. I sort of think of it from my point of view. You know, I want to do things. I want to get things. I want products. If I want to claim benefits, I want to get my benefits. Yeah, if I want to go and get a new driving license, I want to get a driving license. <laughs> and I get fed up with all the inefficiencies of transferring things around. Um, the thing that's driving me mad at the moment is the government's interference in the banking system and the Know Your Client regulations. Because they haven't got enough money, they're trying to turn the banks into an arm of law enforcement. So they've got all this sort of stuff to try and track down where the money is going and hoping they'll catch criminals as a result. The answer is criminals have got enough money to get away with it. Well, does it stop me paying some bills sometimes? And at the moment, I can't trade shares. Because NatWest say they can't talk, who are part of the Royal Bank, say they can't talk to my Royal Bank current account to prove that I have banked with them since birth are me. It's dotty, you know. And the world is mad. And it really annoys me when the government interfere like that. And I don't want to see that going on. I also want to go to places. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to move around the place. And I certainly don't want um, ID cards being used as they were at the end of the Second World War to control movement, etc. So I get worried about some of the ideas behind it. But I do want to be protected. So the government tell me if we all got a wonderful identity card system, we will be protected from terrorism. Because I remember one someone, someone at the beginning of the ID card scheme saying, Ah, yes, no, see, the great thing is when a policeman stops someone on the motorway for speeding or something, they look at their driving license, which is identity, and if this is linked properly back, they can look at it and they'll know if it's a terrorist or not. I thought, hang on. <laughs> yes, I seem to remember this happened in Spain just before a Madrid bombing, but they didn't say, for some reason, it, the ID card didn't say terrorist, you know. And um, this is the big challenge. And the, the real thing is the problem at the bottom. I get asked on a stag party. I leave all identity at home. I travel with cash, <laughs> you know. And there are moments when maybe it would be nicer not to. Uh, Fun enough, I don't suffer from that other big problem uh, that quite a large percentage of the population seem to have of not being in the right place in the evening or at night. And um, sometimes someone who's closely associated with them gets upset about it. And. Um, but I can't imagine. But I'm afraid it happens all too frequently. And the question is, is it our role to try and stop that happening? You know, how much of human nature do we want to control? Um, and it's very difficult. On the I want to be protected thing, of course, we've got that, that's got a whole lot of bit behind it. Of you know, government are now seeing uh, strong authentication of someone's age uh, in order to enforce family-friendly policies. And we're about to have laws coming out which say you cannot visit certain internet websites unless you've decided you say that the family can, or you can, or whatever. Um, it's the, all the anti-porn stuff. Very noble, very good aspirations, um, absolutely the intention is right. But the question is, will it actually work, or will it just cause chaos? You know, the first problem comes, you're right, your, your new bit of software arrives next year in its box. You unwrap it, and you put it in, and it says, are you happy to surf porn, or whatever it says, I'm not quite sure. Now, the question is, do you want to click a yes, which will then identify you as a serial porn addict to various databases, including presumably GCHQ and other places, um, or do you say no, in which case all that's going to happen is one of your children is going to get round it, and so they'll register the IP address anyway, so you'll still be down on the database as a serial porn addict anyway. So I don't know. It's, it's, effectiveness is important, and this is the problem. Sometimes we're sticking plaster over things. So I just worry about effectiveness. But I do want the enabling aspects of it. I do want to have it so that my banks can talk. I do want to have it so that I don't have to keep on telling the government where I live and things like that. So the question is how we do it. Um, I just wanted to point something out, because we live in a common law country still, just. There's a lot of statute law crept in from the continent. 
their continents used to being ordered around and having Big Brother and Big Government tell them things. But equally so, they're very used to finding ways of, of adjusting to the real world, which is why their statute law is really there for aspirational purposes. You'll find that there's a huge amount of local discretion as to how they interpret it. We never understand why they don't obey the law. The reason is they know it's impossible to do so when there are so many rules and, it's a rules and regulatory based law. We used to have a common law which allowed you to get on with things and set boundaries to behaviour. So we're used to the concept the government doesn't interfere with what you're doing unless you're behaving outrageously. And it's, um, and, and somehow from a long time ago, we didn't trust the government. The government was really the king, the monarch, rather. And so we had Magna Carta, and I put like that. And this, I'm afraid if I had lots of time and I drew circles and this, but I couldn't find the right things and the colours didn't come out right, so I did. But we basically got the state, the church, and the legislature. And so the monarch ran everything basically. And then we got a bit fed up with being locked up without trial and doing lots of last things. And we kept on being asked to pay taxes to run everything the monarch wanted to run. So we had Magna Carta and we said, oi, if we're paying for it, we want some say in it. Out of that comes the concept of parliament, the legisl legislature. And somewhere in here, there's the ethical bit, the church, which worries about ethics and things like that. And the interesting thing, the reason I've done this strange hierarchy here is that the monarch, okay, is our state leader. The order of hierarchy was, it used to be slightly different until Tony Blair changed it. But the monarch came top, then the Archbishop of Canterbury, and then the Lord Chancellor in the Lords, who overarched all three parts, well, not the church, but overarched the, um, the Prime Minister, which is the, um, the executive. I should have really put executive at the top of the, of the, of the state. Um, and also overarched um, the Lords and could see that, and also the law, which I've left out of that. The law sits at the side and adjudicates, and so they're like the umpires. Um, but the whole point about that, anyway, the Lord Chancellor is removed, so Tony Blair made himself a bit more senior. But the whole idea <laughs> is that, is that um, the Lords and the Commons are the legislature, and they set the rules which the Prime Minister and his civil service are meant to obey. The challenge we've got now is all these ministers and prime ministers sitting in the commons. He's only in the commons because he's leader of the majority party, if you see what I mean. Um, but he also happens to be the first minister of the executive. And sometimes they forget that they're there to pass laws to control them, the, their successors and themselves. And that's a big danger. Because what happens is the monarch is actually head of this bit. And that's why I've drawn them all that in line. The prime minister and the civil service, and then they boss us around and tell us what to do. But over here, we're meant to be telling them what they're allowed to do. And that's this bit, of, I just want to point this out about why I talk in the way I do about some of these things. Because my interests lie here and in that, rather than in how to make sure that these people are controlled to the best of their ability. Which is why I get briefed by various people who I don't think entirely agree with me, but I do see their point, I'm going to try and put it later. Um, people who designed the IPS and things, and you probably don't know who I'm talking about. Anyway, um, the other thing I'm worrying about is trust, the effectiveness of this. Um, is it people? Is it tokens? We talk about trust the whole time, and most of the time it ends up being trusting the token, the electronics. And that's the problem, and the, uh, it's, it's rather in, epitomized, or, yeah, epitomized by, by the T-scheme and N-stick things. Over here we had T-scheme. It was all about enrolment. It was about levels of trust as a result of enrolling people. It was all about, um, about you know, what were they good for. It was all about that side of it. We were looking at the people behind it. NSTIC, the National uh, for Cyber Security of Trusted Identities and Cyberscapes, whether it's natural or national, it doesn't matter, it's the American one. Strategy, strategy, that was the word. For trusted identities in cyberspace. It's all about trusting the electronics, it's about trusting the tokens. It doesn't look about how you got the people in there. And the challenge is, you know, trust is a contextual. You know, I might trust, you, you, might be, you, know, you might be able to trust me with state secrets. You might not. But would you trust me babysitting your daughter? Well, actually, you'd be safe in my case, funny enough. Not interested in, you know, they're like, no, don't worry. Um, <laughs> the girls. Anyway, anyway so, the, but, um, but that's the problem. 
you don't, it's not context, it's, it's not transferable always, which is of course where we get in terrible troubles and the government gets in trouble, terrible troubles with all its protective markings and stuff like that because they try and do these wide schemes, they suddenly realise that you can't do that because there are people in the system who can be trusted in one context and not in another and we end up with the old Snowden and all the old bits and pieces because someone's uh, where, somewhere where they, for that sort of trust you're looking for, they shouldn't have been. But it's interesting, some other people say that's great doesn't matter. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But it comes from not trusting people. And the way we, how do we build up trust? We drilled it up. I put hospitality. You sit down with people, you enjoy some hospitality, you look them in the eyes, and you, we get a feel for it. Very good con men can still get through that. But most, most of us work that way. Recommendation, you know, if I say, you, know, you can really trust Louise here, I know her really well, etc., you will start to believe that. Now, whether I'm right or not, my, the degree of trust you're putting in Louise will depend on how much you trust me to have got that right. Now, if you know what a good judge of pe people I am, or if you ask my wife, she'd tell you, don't go by what he says. But, in this case, I think I'm right. But, you know, so we can, so, you know, this is, sorry, Louise, I right. It's just, you're looking pink in the middle. You should stand out, you know, instead of all these grey people. There. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I always put my foot in it somewhere, don't worry. Um, and the trouble is box ticking work doesn't work with it. And this is one of the problems, you know, we're introducing. And particularly when we go back to know your client in the banking, it's all about ticking boxes. Have you got these documents that are signed off by somebody else? You know, that's trying to transfer the trust from someone you do trust to say that they trust this person by signing off a form. Well, the trouble is, once you've got this in, in a bit of paper and it's being stored somewhere, it's totally insecure and it'll be copied and put it everywhere. So talk about box ticking that really won't work. It's about the most insecure method I can think of, of doing an, you know, any system you want to really trust. But still, it, it's not going to work. So we've got to think about how we go back to the old days. The challenge with that is there'll be some nice people who, for some reason, get excluded. They rubbed someone up the wrong way. The trouble with the box ticking way is the bad guys can get in all too easily. And also some good guys who are no good at filling in forms just fail to tick the right boxes. And that's another challenge there. And the thing that get, really comes down to, it always gets me very irritated, is our reliance, for instance, on the CRB check. What does a CRB check tell you about someone? Let's say I pass a CRB check. What does it tell you about <coughs> me? Absolutely. It's the only thing is I haven't been caught yet. It's the only thing it tells you. And it's absolutely useless. But yet, we're, And yet the trouble is, if people pass that, when I put them in highly trusted positions, and it's very dangerous. Anyway, for instance, this chappy, he, this is somewhat old slide, but it's, I haven't bothered to update because it's still the same thing. He was a great expert in maps, and he was the leading expert. So he had access to all the wonderful historic maps in all the great uh, libraries and everything around the world. And he started nicking them. And it took him a year, uh, well, some time to find out. He nicked quite a lot before they, because they just couldn't believe it was him. You know, he built up a very trusted state and then something happened. Don't ask me why, he went bad. He, maybe he just got, uh, he just wanted to possess them. You know, people get this urge, collector. I don't know, I don't know if he sold them or what. But the sad thing is that the, da the, the damage he did to our heritage, if you're interested in those areas, was, is, is it, it's immeasurable. You know, you can't go back, you can't replace it, which is really sad. Um, and this is the problem, one of the other things about these things is unravelling, but uh, which I can't remember if I put it on it's unravelling when things go wrong. You can't. The question is, can you trust me? What do you expect? Merlin? That's what I used to look like, rather sweet, wasn't it? Um, I can't remember, look at it. So that was uh, my ancestor, good high point. Uh, we just got in favour, we married King's illegitimate daughter, so that was a good move. Um, that's me when I was younger and fitter, running around mountains. You wouldn't recognise me now, would you? But the problem is I'm also a trained terrorist. Our side against the Russians. But just think what they might find out if they re researched my past and read it wrong. You see, this is the problem with your past. You can read everything two ways. And that's me as a clan chief in Scotland. That's my little brother, looking quite mad, as usual. That's my eldest son. Anyway, so that's another persona. I've got all these different things. And that's me being irresponsible. Now, I didn't really want people to see that because my insurance company would get upset. <laughs> and that's the trouble. There are times when you want to just do something a little bit out of the ordinary and hope you get away with it. 
And if we've got everything, it's too much. So the question is, how do we have some privacy in all this? Right, I want to make assertions about things. I'm entitled to this, I'm over 18, I can buy alcohol, I can smoke, I can get married, I can drive a car, I can do these things. That's what we're really trying to do most of the time. And most of it is pretty low level. You don't really need to know much about the person. Sometimes you don't really want to know who you are. Um, I'm allowed to join, go into this nightclub because I'm over 18. Now, it might be on the stag party scenario, this is not a nightclub you would normally like your name associated with. Why should they have a track of your name? Why should they have the ability to store that and therefore allow other people the ability to find it out and possibly use it for blackmail? And that's the challenge. The blackmail may be that you have been, uh, it may be just straight blackmail trying to get money off you. It may be blackmail trying to get you to adopt a position politically. It may be blackmail trying to secure a government contract. It may be blackmail getting you not to reveal something that you know of some naughtiness within the government. I don't know. But, there's, you know, it isn't necessarily financial blackmail. But the point is, you know, all you need to do is say, I'm over 18. So if we can have a trusted method whereby I can assert something, they can store the certificate that asserted it, and it's reliable enough that that can be presented, if necessary, as evidence in front of a regulatory body or a court of law, we've cracked that problem. And this is where the technology bit comes in, because it is possible to do these things. But a lot of people don't think it is. We're going to have a big problem getting away from the mindset that you have to know the person's name. You don't, always. And that's the problem. The other thing is, of course, you know, this whole thing which we get into is it's my data. And as these databases build up around the place, you know, what's allowed to be swapped? Do I control those things? If I do, how I identify myself to those databases to allow the exchange to take place? How limited, how do we control the limited exchange? So I might say, um, yes, government department, you may verify with the council that I live at that address because they've got my council tax records, etc. But actually, I don't want them to know, um, I can't think what about, because I haven't got any particular secrets, but I'm sure there might be some other things you don't want them to know. Um, or it might be that you're asking another thing because you work for Huntington Life Sciences, and that's the one bit of thing that you didn't want transferred, was the address. That's the bit you've got to keep masked. You need to be in control of your own data, because you're the only person who knows what the impact of that data leak or loss is on you because we're not all the same. If you're in a witness protection program, um, you know, or something like that, people might not even know you are in a way because it may be just you're concealed from the courts and the public, so you go on living a normal life. I don't know. There's lots of reasons. You, only you know what is absolutely vital that other people don't know about you. It may be a crossover that you happen to belong to an organization which is particularly hated by another organization, and you're in that pub. So you don't want to reveal say when you're proving you're over 18 or whatever, I don't know. Um, and so I think there's this whole thing about separating the identifiers and the attributes. The attributes being what I'm trying to claim about myself and the other bit about being, you know, identity or root identity or there may be multiples and that's the bit I'm going to not come down on one side or the other because that's where you end up having a huge argument. I'm very interested by the work of the Jericho Forum, which has sadly now just dissolved itself. <coughs> it's finished doing its bit on deprimatization, but before it dissolved itself, um, it did produce some identity and data commandments and to, to deal with all this stuff. And I think it's well worth looking up. You'll find it on the Open Group site, and uh, their work is going to be taken forward by the Security Forum of the Open Group. And they've taken... Um, God, my Alzheimer's is getting bad. The rules of identity. Kim Cameron. Kim Cameron's rules of identity. But further, it's therefore far more detailed, even worse to get your head around in some ways, but it's all in there about how you protect privacy and still allow certain degrees of control where you need it. Because sometimes you have to protect your boundaries. You have to have a central hierarchical thing. It's just where. The liability issue is an interesting one as well. Because, for instance... Um, Actually, Louise pointed this out very well in the document. You know, you can have a company that's registered in one company, and you're actually dealing with a subsidiary which is in another company, and it's dealing and delivering a project from a third country, and actually it's coming through a fourth country, and you're sitting in the fifth country, and now you've got a problem. Uh, which one do you take to court? Which one do you proceed against? You know, where does the jurisdiction admit? Um, so, which is part of who carries the can for when if the identity doesn't work, and this is a big issue. 
because if you're a commercial organization and you're issuing identity and you say this is gold standard, you might find you had legal liability for doing it, and, um, which is why I probably should have put that higher up, which is why we end up looking at government identity systems. Um, and for a lot of things, we don't need huge, great gold-plated identity uh, assurance. It really depends, you know, how, what you just need to prove about the person. If I can see you normally pay your bill, right, PayPal, eBay, perfect. The feedback on eBay, I've got a good feeling if I'm going to take a risk or not doing business with them, you know. And um, because of the, uh, the guarantees, I'll get my money back. They can verify the other bit. I, d I don't really need to know who the seller is and lots of detail about them. And it's a very loose identity system, but it's based on building up a, a bi biographical identity, effectively, which is quite good enough for the purpose. The penalties, should they be civil or criminal for some of these things, you need, we need to think about that. But the interesting thing about the sovereign immunity is, <coughs> that's why we keep going back to passports and driving licenses. Because <coughs> you can't sue the government if the passport weren't valid. And we know, what, how many passports they say out there are, um, uh, are for? I think there's 10,000 passports or something they've issued that actually are not correctly issued. I mean, they were issued through to, to people with fraudulent things. How they know it's that many, I'm not very sure. And of course, you've got the further problem, which I, if ever they get on, anyone interested in immigration here? No, very wise. But if you ever get into that in big ways, it's very interesting. We have several million legal illegals. What's a legal illegal? Their parents came here when they were turfing people out of, say, uh, Africa or foreign parts, etc., and came into the country when we had a much freer movement of people. And also, it was okay and some of them were Commonwealth citizens and things like that, and we didn't worry about it then. Then we passed an Immigration Act, said that well, these people couldn't come here, but they were already here, running businesses, pillars of the community, mayors, councillors, all sorts of things like that. <coughs> but they no longer really qualified to be here, but we couldn't do a big cleaning out. They've been here for years, they were well established in the community, so they are just let run. Now their children were born here, got birth certificates, but weren't really entitled to birth certificates because their parents weren't entitled to be citizens at that point when they were born or even afterwards because it was sort of retrospective. So all those people because they were born here. Now being born here does not, unlike America, entitle you to British citizenship. In America I think it does but it doesn't here. So just the fact you managed to pop a baby out in Heathrow Airport doesn't entitle that baby to citizenship. So all these children who've now got passports because they've got all the credentials through the system because they were born here but their parents weren't strictly speaking um, correct are legal illegals. So the question, what do we do about it? <coughs> now, the government haven't really thought about this one. I don't want to trouble David Cameron with him with it just when he's in, having such flack over all the rest of it. But it's quite an interesting problem. If you try to unravel all of this, I don't know how far we are. When Scotland's got devolution, how many Scots do we have to send home? Because they're mercenaries now in the British <laughs> Army. And anyway, it's an interesting thought. Anyway, this is all about ID. But the danger is, you see, they can stop you in the street once you or oh, they could or not. Anyway, the point about this is, yes, government's got a role because this is the whole point about it. The, what was described as the breeder documents, the base documents, the root documents. They tend to be government issued. Passport, driving license, your NENI number, a birth certificate, all these sort of things. And this is the great thing, you see. They, they, they can, you can use this. We do trust them because, by and large, is it still called the IPS or is it now the passport office? Or? It's passport service now. We should stop changing names. Anyway, yeah. Um, anyway, so the passport mm -hmm. does a very, very, very good job. You know, when you look at what they're up against, lost stuff, things like that. What I've just given you are the difficult ones. Um, actually, they're coping with that very well. And the, the quantity of fraudulent ones is tiny, absolutely tiny compared to the number out there. Which means you can rely on it, and that's the great thing. But there's, and you've got this great thing. If you're always falling back to that, you can't be sued. So this is the great thing. Now, but if we're going to deduplicate things, now we go back to the whole thing, why did the ID card fail? In fact, Roger, I'm not going to go into deeply. But the whole point was they want a single central database deduplicated on, on biometrics where they could really work out they hadn't got people registered twice. And logically, that's what you want if you want this centrally driven hierarchical system where somewhere there is one thing version of you that then you go out from. And out of that, you've got the central cell. And there are ways we can do one-way trust to verify it. We can make sure that no other um, numbers are kept in there. That all the databases are separate. So a national insurance number, national health number, everywhere, which help counter fraud, by the way, are separate. 
In America, you get their one social security number, or if they're a foreign tax number, and you've got to link into all the databases. It's great. You know. Over here, if you want to steal someone's identity, you've got to nick about seven, you know, let's see, you need driving license, passport, council tax, uh, HMRC tax number. There may be a second one as well, because you may want two HMRC, both as PAY and self-employed or something. Uh, what have you got? NHS. You know, you can go on. There's an awful lot of numbers. And the friction, people show up at the boundaries when they suddenly one bit of the biography doesn't look right. <coughs> And that's when you catch the criminal. So it's actually very useful, as a law enforcement thing, having these separate things rather than having it all linked in some ways. But you could have trust systems whereby the NHS can then verify back to the centre, to the root, and then say, da da da. And then they can work out from somewhere else to use that to find from another one if they're allowed to, whether you're entitled to an NHS treatment or whether or not, whether you're a resident. Because you wouldn't keep it all in one place. You're separating out the attributes and the identifiers. And there are lots of ways you could get around it. So they, people can't suddenly go in and get extra data. One of the old weaknesses, I think, of the original design of the NIR, the National Identity Register, was going to be, was there was quite a lot of information that if a bad guy got inside, might have been available. I don't know for certain, but the problem really comes always is if the bad guy is your government. What happens if the Maoists, Mao Zedong from South London, manage to get into Parliament and take over? Now, I'm using a ridiculous one there because I don't want to get into politics if we might. But I mean, Hitler got in there legally, absolutely legally, um, through legal routes, etc. He then behaved highly illegally and got more power, and then he rolled into, into Holland, for instance. And the reason they managed to roll up all the Jews in Holland within two weeks is because they had a very good ID card system. You could tell from the ID card what ethnically they were. So they could just stop people in the street, look at the ID card, choop, and they got the lot. Two weeks it took them. So those are the dangers of the thing, and you have to be aware. You know, we think we live in a wonderful free society. It's getting less and less so, I think. But anyway, but having said that, I don't think we. I, mean, I don't believe we're going to go bad, but I don't want to enable it, to help it. Right. Um, the government's got used to. You've got to stop the government looking too much personal information because you never know how it's going to get used. And unfortunately, people, whatever they're in, they may be bankers, they may be government, they may be doing, they may be me, we have a habit of covering up our mistakes. It's instinctive. And we will use, if there's enough of a career hit in it, etc., you know, it will happen. And so you've got to be very careful. Because if the government starts getting access and counter-terrorism laws to everything, it could be dangerous again, because you'll get things. Apparently, also, when I say done this, um, this is a comment from someone saying the Aust Austrians have got a very well separated central root identity from how it can be accessed and how it can be proved. I haven't studied it, I don't know much about it, but so it may be worth taking a look at. Now, some people say, oh, but the commercial organisation, you've got to be really careful. And we do, because they can collect information across databases, and that could be highly dangerous, and we're going to have to be very careful of it. But in general, Commercial organisations are just trying to make money out of it. Okay, we may or may not like that. We may or may not get citizens' rights to get money, you know, be given a percentage of that money, or to control it more. But how much damage can they do to a citizen's life? They could do possibly. And, and I can imagine once we get, sort of, say, insurance companies going across databases or other companies selling money information, like, you know, Tesco's telling my insurance company how much chocolate I buy, um, and things like that. Um, I mean, I'm using chocolate a simple bit, but there were proposals to limit the amount of salt that men could buy and things like that. I'm mean, serious proposals. Um, and so, but if that was then you're done as a reporting up to the insurance company, when we get the Internet of Things and everything's linked, if your car starts repo reporting that its tires are a bit worn or a bit too worn and you're doing a long journey, it gets reported back to your insurance company. You're suddenly uninsured, possibly, halfway through a 2,000 mile journey. Or should you stop and try and find some rare fit trials? You know, there are all sorts of issues around this we need to think about, the linking, because they could damage the citizen. Um, but the problem is the governments can lock you up or stop you getting jobs or stop you moving and things like that. It really affects your life. Anyway, so is there a role for government to do it? Definitely. They've got to understand what technologies are out there. They've got to understand that this can be done. I don't think they should be developing stuff themselves. Um, they need to think about the framework. So we, in a way, I've, I've highlighted some of the issues around that, about where we need controls, where we don't need controls, where we need access, where we need rights, etc. The thing that really worries me is if they try and insist that they've, uh, they've got the only source of ID. I don't think we need a single root ID myself. I think there are other methods of doing this. 
So I'm personally not of the thing of the single root ID, and I'm sure that you will hear other scenarios around this. Um, but I was just pointing out where the thing could come from. So I don't want to see a single government ID used for everything. And um, Louise's comment, beware of grand schemes. Someone's making a lot of money out of them. You're certainly not going to get what you want. Um, and my final thought, really, is a lot of people seem to think all this idea is going to give you a lot of security, and you'll know what you're doing, and everything will be safe and wonderful, etc. It's an illusion. It won't. There are still going to be nasty people there. You don't know when the performance is going to go funny. You don't know any of those sort of things. And all I want to be able to say is, I'm me. You know, please let me do. And I don't want to be told what to do the whole time. I've always been a bit of a rebel, I think. And that's me. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>